I don't have the uh, the uh, video capture uh, on my screen, so I can't see what video is being filmed while I'm actually making the video. So I'm sorry that I kind of drifted out of the picture on that last uh, video. Hopefully, I'll do a better job of standing in the middle uh, on this particular video. So now let's talk about franchises. A franchise is nothing other than a way of buying into an existing business. Even if you have to build a location, in theory, you're building, or I'm sorry, you're buying a proven business model. Now, if you look on the slide, you see the things we talked about that you get when you get an existing building. I'm sorry, buy an existing business. So what does buying into a franchise help you with? Well, when it comes to facilities, uh, they provide guidance. Uh, a lot of the very successful franchises are very specific on where you can uh, put your location. For example, I know that uh, when the Orange Leaf came to town, they looked at several different locations before settling uh, on their uh, on their existing location uh, near Academy Sports. The equipment, again, they provide you with guidelines with a lot of the, uh, particularly a lot of the food franchise, they tell you exactly how everything has to be. It's all laid out. And they may even sell you the equipment. And that can be a little bit tricky. One of the things you want to ask yourself when you're buying into a franchise is, how is the franchisor making money? There are lots of different ways they can make money. One of the ways they can make money is they can say, well, when you build your facility, you need to buy this equipment from this manufacturer. And you think, oh, they've negotiated a good deal. Maybe not. <laughs> Maybe the franchisor is getting a share of the sales on that equipment. And so that is a way they're making money. That's something you would want to be aware of. And if you have the option of buying it from somebody else, you might want to consider buying it from somebody else. You get a business model. And in theory, what you get is a proven business model. And certainly when you get the McDonald's of the world, the Subways of the world, it really is proven. And a lot of the newer franchises, and there are tens of thousands of, well, tens of thousands by stretch, there are thousands of franchise opportunities in the United States. Many of them are not proven. Uh, there is a franchise model, or a franchise that operates in this town where I just happen to know uh, long ago, not, not currently, the franchisor. So you think, oh, it's a very successful franchise model. Not really. The, they have a lot of franchise locations that don't do very well. Is the franchisor, frankly, he hadn't made a lot of money. At one point, this has been several years ago, uh, they had, he hadn't personally made more, made more than $100,000 ever yet. And the franchise was several years old. So they weren't making much money. So that tells you the franchisees probably weren't making a lot of money either. So in theory, it's proven. In reality, maybe not so. And even then, maybe it's proven in one context, but you're trying to operate it in another context. You are in hopefully getting a product that's relatively standardized and, again, hopefully proven. As far as employees go, the really good franchises uh, offer Franchisors offer training, training to you as the owner, training to your employees. In many cases, uh, obviously McDonald's has places, training grounds where you can send people. But a lot of the smaller franchisors, they will send training teams out when you establish operations to help you get things going. Procedures, hopefully, are all worked out. Uh, the reputation, hopefully, you're buying into a strong brand. And an example of this is uh, when we were moving from Lubbock to uh, Wichita Falls. I've driven between Lubbock and Wichita Falls many, many times. One time when I was driving uh, by myself, so I get to choose where we eat. Uh, daddies don't often get to choose where they eat when the family's with them. I was pulling into that, uh, that metropolis of Seymour and was really surprised as I drove up. I'd never noticed it before. There was a Subway sandwich chain there. Uh, and it just so happened to Sub sandwich sounded really good to me, and I went in without hesitation because I knew it was a Subway, and I assumed that it's going to be a certain level of quality or Subway wouldn't allow the franchise to continue in operation. So in a sense, that's a great example of how having the right, being a part of the right chain 
can make you walk into, uh, into a store. Uh, and incidentally, did you know that in terms of the number of units, Subway is the largest franchise in the world? Many people, me included, would assume it's McDonald's. It's not. It's Subway. And just think about how many Subways there are in Wichita Falls versus McDonald's, and you'll see there's actually more Subways, even in this town, than there are McDonald's restaurants. Customers uh, come in part from the reputation of the brand, but also many franchises have national marketing campaigns, and they give you firm suggestions for your local marketing campaigns. Uh, the legal, the suppliers, hopefully one of the things you get by being in a franchise is you get better buying power because you're bundling uh, the purchases or maybe you're coming from corporate uh, and so they negotiate a better price. You hope that's the case. Again, you probably want to verify to see whether the franchisor is making money off of those supplies. And if they are, that's something that ought to concern you a little bit about whether you're, about whether you're getting the best deal. As far as franchising, there is a legal document called the abbreviated the FDD, the Financial Disclosure Document. Very important. Has a ton of details. I had a, a graduate student once that took my graduate entrepreneurship class, and he had recently bought a UP or not bought, he had started his own UPS store. The FDD was that thick, and it had all kinds of information in it. So great document to look through when you're interested in buying a franchise. And then lastly, one of the things that buying a franchise will do for you is they're going to tell you pretty much how much money it takes to get started. In some, of the case, in some cases, very successful franchisors will actually provide financing to help you buy the franchise. So in, in essence, they invest in you. Uh, they can also give you some suggestions on how to do their various investors. So Franchising can be a little more complicated than you might think because when you buy a franchise, you have to be real clear on what are you getting. Are you getting the right to establish one franchise or are you getting an entire area? Munir Lalani, the guy that uh, endowed the Lalani Center for Entrepreneurship that I have the privilege of directing, he quote unquote made his fortune in Whataburgers. When he uh, took over the Whataburger in the mall, back uh, a long time ago, uh, he negotiated with Whataburger the rights to this area and he ended up building 10 Whataburgers in North Texas and Southern Oklahoma in six years. So he had the right to do multiple locations. Incidentally, particularly in the fast food franchises, it's more and more common to see franchisees that have multiple locations. Uh, I'm friends with one of the McDonald's franchisees in town, and he has four uh, McDonald's in this area, and there's a lot of cost reasons to make that happen. You may even have a master franchise agreement where basically you have the right to become a franchisor of your own, and that you get a certain region, and then you develop franchisees uh, within that region. So now you're interested in buying your own franchise. How do you go about it? Incidentally, because I'm doing this in a video lecture, I, I can't show you, but Entrepreneur Magazine, just type the word Entrepreneur Magazine in a search engine. Uh, the Entrepreneur Magazine website has a fantastic uh, franchising section. How to do it, fastest growing, uh, top home-based businesses. That really is kind of one of their niches that they've carved out that they are uh, a wealth of information on franchising. So if you get serious about looking at franchises, I encourage you to go to Entrepreneur Magazine online. Uh, it has a lot of information. Again, you're going to want to do your due diligence. Now, instead of talking to the owner of that location, you're going to talk to people, uh, other franchisees. And any good franchisor will have no concerns whatsoever with providing you with the names and the phone numbers of several franchisees. And you want to ask them. Uh, what about it? Did you get any surprises? Do you match the profitability that was suggested? Do you think the franchisee, is, I'm sorry, the franchisor is uh, treating you well? Uh, then you want to also, particularly if it's a new franchise, ask about the stability of the franchisor. I'm giving them a lot of money. I'm buying into a brand. Are they likely to be able to stay in business? Uh, because if they go out of business, it may be impossible 
to keep your franchise going. An example of that is Bennigan's. And then lastly, you want to ask yourself about the integrity and the, the financial motivation of the franchisors. In, in some cases, in the FDDs, it will actually show you the um, one of the things they have to put in there is whether the franchisor is being sued. And it's very common that they are being sued. What you're worried about is if a bunch of the franchisees are suing them. And this gets into the concept of fiduciary uh, responsibility. And that simply says when you have a fiduciary responsibility, you basically have a responsibility to look out for the financial success of that other entity. So you would assume that a franchisor has a fiduciary responsibility to the franchisees. I've told you that business law, in, for the most part, is state law. And in most states, the courts have ruled very clearly franchisors do not have a fiduciary responsibility to the franchisees. And you'll see uh, several well-known franchisors that uh, are, have been sued by their franchisees because they're saying that they're taking steps that are not in the franchisee's best interest. Burger King has a lot of issues with their franchisees, and Quiznos went through a very extended litigation where franchisees sued Quiznos because they said they were trying to make too much money by putting stores in too densely and making money off the, the startup fees, and they were leaving franchisees without an ability to make a lot of profit. So you can't assume that they've got your best interest at heart. You have to have your best interest at heart. Then when you get into the deal, the nice thing about franchisees uh, is, or fr franchises is because of past abuses, most states, well actually I shouldn't say most states, federally they require the financial disclosure document which lays out the terms very clearly. And this is where you're going to want to see where the money goes. Because not only do you have to pay a fee to set up a franchise, usually, you also have recurring revenue. Or, or recurring payments, however you want to call it, that go back to the franchisor. And the deals can be fairly complicated, so here's a rule of thumb. Before you pay yourself, okay, before you pay taxes, before you service your debt, all those very important things. So if you come just kind of your income from operations, if your total fees to the franchisor are about a third of that. That's about average. That's a, a decent rule of thumb. So you can see one downside to buying a franchise is that you owe a lot of money back to the franchisor on a recurring basis. So now let's take it up in the next level. You've started your own business. It's going great. Now you're starting to figure out, hmm, this is working great where I am. Maybe this would work great a lot of places. And you ask yourself, well, maybe I could build a franchise out of this. That's potentially a very good idea. So how do you do that? Well, now you have to write a business plan for sure, because that's going to get rolled into the financial disclosure document, um, so that you can explain to people why they want to basically buy your business model. You're going to have to do a complete intellectual property inventory and make sure that it's all protected. All your, you've got trademarks on everything. You've taken all of the procedures that you've developed over time in your business and you've got them all copyrighted and cataloged so that it belongs to you. Then you're going to have to prepare an FDD, not an insignificant amount of work. You have to prepare the manuals to train the people. You're going to have to pick the franchisees, and then you're going to have to help them. And I'll emphasize this on the other slide, but if what this sounds to you like is, hmm, it's, it sounds like a very different skill set to build a franchise than it is to run a single location or a small number of locations, that's really the case. So compared to you just taking your successful business model and open up stores all over the, uh, the country, what are the advantages of doing that instead through a franchise model? One is it's lower cost to you. Um, so for the most part, Starbucks is not franchising. They're not franchises. They are all company-owned stores. So Starbucks has paid for every one of those stores. 
McDonald's, that's not the case. McDonald's, uh, I think no more than a quarter of the stores are company owned. In fact, I think it's a lot smaller percentage than that. So all these franchisees own these stores. So they put up the money to build them and stock them and, and those sorts of things. So one advantage of going in with a franchise model is it's cheaper. The second is, is you have multiple ways to create a revenue stream. You can create revenue just by selling the rights to the franchises. Um, then you have the theory that says, if I have a franchise, I'm the franchisor, and a franchisee comes in and buys a franchise from me, they're probably going to be more motivated to succeed than if instead of doing this through a franchise, I instead open up a store in another town and I hire a business manager to run it. You could argue that that isn't going to be always true, and, I, and I'd agree with you. But on average, the sense is, is that franchisees are going to be more motivated than paid store managers to succeed. And two, again, the, the idea that franchisees are pretty motivated, they may be giving you a continual feedback of good ideas. So you all know that I cannot sing Worth Beans, and we know the, the $5 foot long song for Subway. Believe it or not, that was not an idea that came out of corporate Subway. There was a franchise uh, franchisee down in Florida that started doing these $5 specials and saw their sales really go up. And corporate said, what's going on with your store? You're really doing great. And that's where the idea for the $5 foot long uh, came from. Well, what's the downside to expanding your business by setting it up as a franchise. The first is you're going to share profits because just as you expect this franchisee to be more motivated than a store manager, they're also going to expect a higher return, which is to say more money because they are taking on the risk of success. Uh, you have less control. Once you've brought a franchisee in, it's hard to get rid of them even if you don't like the way they're running uh, their business. When I say the increased people hassle, what that means is you're now dealing with a bunch of franchisees who are really, truly business owners, and they're often not afraid to be vocal about telling you what they think, probably more so than it would be if they were just all your employees. Uh, it takes money to set it up, to set a franchise up, because you've got to do all of the documents. And like I talked about before, you really need a different skill set. Uh, running a franchise as a franchisor is different than running a single or even multiple locations as a franchisee. I read an article uh, in Entrepreneur Magazine not too long ago about a, about a father and sons who had built uh, a successful hamburger uh, store franchise. And basically, the dad got to the point where he said, I, I want, he, he was the the, the businessman, the sons were pretty young. And he got to the point where he said, I, I just don't want to do this franchise or thing anymore. I'm tired of this. I What I really enjoyed was when I was running the hamburger stores. And so he kind of said, I, I'm out. I'm going back to doing what I love to do. So to wrap it all up, final lecture in our entrepreneurship semester together. Uh, again, if you are have been intrigued by this entrepreneurship class and you say, I think I'd really like to run my own business, but I just can't see me starting it. The good news is there's probably opportunities for you over the next several years. Um, even if you don't buy an existing business, but don't feel like you have the creativity to start something your own, then there's franchising. And that has its own pros and cons. And if you launch a business and you decide you want to scale it, you could do that by a franchise, and again, that has its own pros and cons. So I look forward to seeing you uh, next Monday and Wednesday at uh, Hatton Road, giving your entrepreneurial presentations. See you.